The words of the chorus are, come on up to the house, come on up to the house. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. Come on up to the house. Whenever you hear, come on up to the house. This is your chance to offer the invitation to worship. Here we go. Well, the moon is broken and the sky is cracked. Come on up to the house. The only thing you can see is all that you lack. Come on up to the house. Oh, your crying won't do you no good. Come on. Everybody sing. You got to come on up to the house. That's it. Come on up to the house. The world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Come on up to the house. No light in the tunnel. No irons on the fire. Come on. That's what my Norwegian friend says when, you're, when he's very nervous and trying to calm down. <laughs> Could you take out your uh, program, agenda, whatever? What is it? Order of service. <laughs> and then uh, in the response of reading, for there is hunger and thirst in body and soul. For there is suffering of every kind and a desire to heal. For there are strangers asking both silently and aloud to belong. Well, hi, welcome. My name is uh, Tom Dooley. I accepted the offer to uh, welcome you 
and um, welcome you to the church where we're asked to uh, to be something more, and that is to uh, grow our soul, to know more, and that is to free our mind, and to do more, and that means change the world. And uh, when I talked to Jason um, about the welcome, he gave me two words of wisdom. He said, A, three minutes, Tom. <laughs> so I do have some notes organized in three points here, and I hope I stick to the three minutes. <laughs> But first of all, I'm going to use the image. Here, here's a, an, uh, the image of the Pope, because we've all watched him. And I think most everybody that I have heard really, really thinks he's done some great things. And that is he's integrated what he believes into his life. And the second thing I heard Jason tell me was, that in order for our community to kind of get to know each other, Jason said, well, you know, expose yourself a little bit so, uh, so that people can get to know me maybe a little bit more too, and then you'll share yourselves with me and other people. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to try and use the three minutes, try and take what I know of what the Pope is trying to tell us and a little bit of my own background. And I'm going to use the image of a slice of tree, but I'm going to be pointing to something. Um, the rings, right? The rings on the tree. But not only the rings, but you see a knot or two. And so our lives are all filled with knots, right? So I'm going to point to a couple of rings that all of us might have, or that I have particularly, and see if we can't integrate it. I think the Pope, even though he, he didn't say this in his Spanish language or in English, he lived, as many of us who were touched by the Jesuits know the word magis, which means do it some more, more, ad mayorum, do it. Don't just know it, don't be it, don't do it, but do it more. Be it more, know it more. Well, I was first exposed to the Jesuits in high school. My father had spent six years in university with Jesuits, and so he sent, sent us all the way to Jesuit boarding schools. After that, I was in college and I became a Jesuit. I was in Jesuit, as a Jesuit, for quite a long time. And as a Jesuit, I, like all of them, was educated pretty much couple graduate degrees, philosophy, and I was also did social sciences because I believed, as all Jesuits do, that changing the world is imperative. We have to do it. And I lived that. I taught in St. Louis, in the very, very, you've heard about some of the problems of St. Louis. I was down in Prudigo. That was a tough place helping people learn their GED, how to read, how, that sort of thing. I was on the Rosebud Reservation for about five years living with the people. Teaching, learning, probably just as much. I lived in Milwaukee in the inner city, fighting for social justice. That's the first minute of my talk. The second minute starts off a little bit differently, and that is I had to leave the Jesuits. It's been a long time there. Not because anything the Jesuits ever taught me was wrong. It was, it was, maybe it was more than I could do. You know, Francis could do it, and I know some of the great Jesuits that are still in the Jesuits do it. I couldn't. I couldn't live without my fellow Jesuit brothers. They were so important to me. And this was back in tumultuous days of racial busting apart, and they began leaving, and so did I. I left the Catholic Church then, too, 
And not because I thought, I always thought and studied social justice of what they taught was wonderful. It's just that when one of my real close Jesuit brothers, who he left, had a daughter, and then the church turned on him. She was gay. So he said, the hell with you. <laughs> he turned on the church back. And he became then a minister. He married his daughter to a wonderful young partner woman. I have all kinds of, I keep contact with all them. Um, there, I, I can't unring the bell. I, I, I love whatever they taught me. I just couldn't live up to it, perhaps. I did get married. I had three kids. Now, at the end of my second cent, uh, minute, I want to just tell you that um, I did go on and do some more studies, believe it or not, <laughs> as if I didn't have enough, I guess. I went to not a Jesuit school, but I went to Wisconsin to, in engineering. They did give me an exam because you know I did philosophy and social science, and then they said, can you do math? Well, I finished that up, and then I heard about a wonderful opportunity here in Grand Rapids, and that's why I brought my family here, because Aquinas College was starting. They wanted to start a computer department, and oh my God, what a great 30 years it was for me. I got to start everything, teach classes, design the classes, hire the faculty. It was marvelous. That's the end of my second uh, minute. It, it, I mean, it's, it, your life, like mine, is just so jam-packed we could spend a long time, but none of us want to do that this morning. My, I want to tell you about my last period in my life, which is the most important to me now, because it's real. The first thing was that it was filled with a lot of broken parts, fractures. The first was my oldest kid, um, who sometimes comes here with me about 10 or 12 years ago, after being everything, he was awarded at a collegiate level, at a state level, and even nationally, on a collegiate level here in Grand Rapids, at the same school I taught at, the best athlete. And graduation, he got two departments that gave him the highest award. He, but he went to college and he succeeded in getting a couple graduate degrees, but it fell apart and I had to go out to California and pick him up. Now you've heard about cancer, cancer of the arm. He had got cancer of the mind. What's the name? Oh, it doesn't matter, does it? Whether it's bipolar, it's, turn out to be schizophrenia. No, he's not schizophrenic. He is a person, a real wonderful person, who had a disease, has a disease, schizophrenia. It's no fault of his own, of course, nor any fault of it when you get, or you and I get cancer, which I did. It teaches you a lot. Um, at the same time, uh, my wife of 30 plus years left. There's not causality there. It's, our lives are way too complex to say one causes another. But clearly mourning is very, very difficult. Dealing with sick kids, um, that's very tough. Um, but I want to tell you more importantly about the high points. One was about 10 years, about the same time that my son got so sick, I had been coming off and on to with you here to Fountain Street, I started coming more regularly and it has increased very much. And I think my son and I then some years ago, we got word that we had been joined now for, I forget how long, but I could look it up in a record. That doesn't make any difference to me, but sometimes he will still come. Um, another, so to you and the whole environment here and is very, very important to me. And I come, I think, every week, and between times, too. Like yesterday, we spent a whole day in the program uh, Befriender. I want to tell you also about something that happened yesterday, and that was a NAMI walk. 
I'm surprised that people just don't know about NAMI. That's initials, N-A-M-I, National Alliance on Mental Illness. They saved me, like Fountain Street saved me. 12 years ago, when my boy crashed, I didn't know it was going to ever happen. I went to a support group. People now come to our support groups. So I've been very active um, on the board. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, I, uh, I, I guess I must have missed the board meeting. And lo and behold, the next meeting, they said, Tom, did you know you're president? <laughs> so, so I accepted that. And I, I spend a good deal of my day listening when people call. I'm the person they call. I want you to know about it because we have support groups, we understand. None of us are paid. These are all people that are going through it. And there's only those kind of people that ever understood me. Well, you know, everybody tries, of course, but that's it. So I want you to know about NAMI. I'd like any, um, you're, you're welcome to ask any piece. This is all kind of exposing myself. Um, so that you get any kind of information that you might. Remember that when I don't know how to summarize it, I said I'm going to just say that and kind of combine what we hear Fred saying all the time and what the Pope says in his words, and that is magis. Free the mind, not once, magis. That means again and again, more. Let's grow our souls, you and I, more than we have now, more than we've ever done. Let's change the world. Let's really bear down and let's, let's go after it. And um, I really, I, I'm very happy to have had this and uh, thank you for listening. And I'm with the order of service. <laughs> Hello, Fountain Street. We're going to share some kindness with you right now. Here is a mantra that I give to you, and it's something that is really very easy to do. A way to be in this world that makes it better and shows you every step how you really matter. Here we go. Be kind, be nice, be loved. Believe in yourself, be kind, be nice, be loved, believe in yourself. Being kind starts inside from the love you show, how you light up the world with your inner glow. By sharing your personal love and respect, you treat others in a way that you expect. Be kind, be nice. Be loved, believe in yourself, be kind, be nice, be loved, believe in yourself. These ways to be are the easiest way. We came here to love and to love every day. Just a note to yourselves. I've learned with my age, it sees you being kind and anger or rage. Be kind, be nice. Be loved, believe in yourself, be kind, be nice, be loved, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself and who you are, that each one of us is a bright, shiny star. Be yourself, be loved, be nice and be kind, you will be happy, that's what you'll find. Be kind, be nice. Be loved, believe in yourself, be kind, be nice, be loved, believe in yourself. Now I need everyone to sing it along. One, two, three, four. Be kind, be nice, be loved, believe in yourself, be kind, be nice, be loved, believe in yourself. Now we're going to do a little call and response with some scatting. We've been practicing it this, this morning, and you can call it right back. Ba, 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 ba. 
to be kind, be kind, be nice, be love, believe in yourself, be kind, be nice, be love, believe in yourself. <laughs>
some words of wisdom from ancient and modern times, and a reminder also of the struggles of the day. In the Christian lectionary this morning, they're continuing the recitation of the book of James. Uh, James is supposed to be Jesus' brother and who was the leader of the Jerusalem community after his death. In it, he writes, or is written, I should say. We don't know that he actually wrote it. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing with oil. It goes on, but the point here is that every circumstance calls forth an action, a response. Peter Singer, my favorite difficult philosopher, contemporary over at Princeton, who is notorious as well as brilliant, in his book, Writings on the Ethical Life, or Writings on an Ethical Life, excuse me, says, we are, we, were we incapable of empathy? I'll start that again. Were we incapable of empathy? of putting ourselves in the position of others and seeing that their suffering is like our own, ethical reasoning would lead nowhere. If emotion without reason is blind, reason without emotion is impotent. And now a witty saying from William Butler Yeats. This is for Gary, who is the, who is the literary guy down here. Stumbled on it in my readings this week. It's in the midst of a book which is unattributed, but I found it so cute I had to use it. Being Irish, he had an abiding sense of tragedy which sustained him through temporary periods of joy. <laughs> Every week it is my practice, I hope, to share with you the story of someone, usually a person of color, in this case a woman, who unfortunately in the confusions of law enforcement and the struggles to do right and wrong ended up dead. I do this because as difficult as it is, we must not, we must not let it slip from our minds that people of color in generally are always more at risk in the world we share, at least in this country. On November 10th, 2014, a 40-year-old woman named Ann Arbor woman was shot and killed after she confronted Ann Arbor City Police with a knife. Officers were dispatched to a home in the 2000 block of Winewood Avenue in Ann Arbor at 11.45 p.m. Sunday night for a domestic disturbance. When officers arrived at the scene, they were confronted by the woman, Aura Rosser, 40, who was armed with a knife. One officer fired his woman, weapon at the woman, striking her. Medical personnel declared the woman dead at the scene. An investigation into the incident has been turned over to the Michigan State Police. I don't know what has happened since. I ask you not to judge one way or the other, but simply lift up the reality that law enforcement in this country is not always as equal or as just as we hope it could be. You may have seen, if you run into me on Facebook, that. Uh, I have found a source of yard signs. If you wish to own your own support of the Black Lives Matter movement, as do I, and you would like one, I will get you one, but you have to tell me. They're cheaper if I buy a lot. Let me know. By the way, I still do hurt if you were here last week, I told everyone that my left leg and my hip and my knee started hurting like mad last week without warning. After telling you about it, I got lots of kind thoughts and much advice. I now have a choice between acupuncture, yoga, physical therapy, chiropractic, cortisone, hanging inverted in boots, meditating, and just waiting it out. I'm waiting it out. More on why later. Uh, this church year, for those who don't know, uh, we're using the arc of the year to go on two metaphorical journeys, one inner and one outer. The inner journey is this fall, that is to invite you to connect, to commune, and to commit 
to make the effort to go deeper into your world, into your spiritual life, starting with making the connection and then going deeper into communion and further into commitment. You would think that in this age of smartphones and Wi-Fi everywhere, we are already too connected. We should be disconnecting. We should be retreating from the ever-present onslaught of information and opportunities and entertainment. But the reality is, and I think you would agree with me, that what we are doing is we're trading authentic, three-dimensional, messy human connections for the tidy, two-dimensional connections that we can hold in our hand, and when we don't like it, we can shut off. We all prefer a tidy connection over a messy one. That's not new. I was, when I was a kid, we were told of the dangers of the boob tube. Who remembers that phrase? Staring transfixed in front of the television when your parents would say, go out and play with your friends. But howdy doody was much more interesting than my neighbor across the street. Now it's far more difficult. But it's older than that. It really is. For many here in the church, the attractions of a simple, straightforward, but two-dimensional religion just didn't work for you. Maybe you've seen a, a bumper sticker or heard a song, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And that works for many. But if you're in this room, it didn't work for you, or it won't work for you, and anything like that simply won't work. You don't want the flat, two-dimensional, boilerplate, sloganized version of religion. You want it to be round and thick and three-dimensional, and if it's a little messy, that's exactly the point. We want our religion to be as real as our lives. Except there's one problem. That tendency to make simplistic answers doesn't stop when you enter a liberal church. In fact, we're as good at it as anyone else. So let's admit that as much as we say we're better than others, we're not. How many times have you found people in this church or other liberal churches saying very smugly, well, we don't believe in all that worn out stuff. We're better than that. Or something similar to, you can believe anything you want in this church. Or, as long as no one gets hurt, you may do whatever you want. Which, when you think about it, are preposterous statements. So we're good at the two-dimensional answer as well. If we are honest, we will admit that we like slogans as much as anybody else. Like any faith. Even liberal religion has to connect with the complete three-dimensional reality we live in, the full length and breadth and depth of existence. For the last two weeks, I've touched upon the length and breadth dimensions, pulling us out of the easy confinements of thinking that now is only here and that I am the only one that matters. But this one, this depth dimension, this is the hard one. And like the Pope, I ask for your prayers to speak wisely and well as I tread upon tender ground. As I have in the last two weeks, I look to my mentor from 40-some years ago, James Luther Adams, a contemporary of the Niebuhrs and friend of Paul Tillich, who observed in an essay I read and have read many times, that liberal religion in wide sectors has tended to identify religion with the good life, meaning doing good personally. Little attention, he says, is given to the tragedy or the pathos of life. This is important because we're liberals and we like to think, well, we like to be optimistic. We like to be confident. Liberal religion grew up as part of the European Enlightenment, a word which means to throw light on the darkness. And liberal religion in all its forms believes that more knowledge and science and progress will lead us over times, over time, excuse me, toward what one of my 19th century predecessors called progress onward and upward forever. Tragedy and pathos, 
the thought that things can go wrong and you can't stop them from going wrong, well, that's not optimistic. That's not confident. Of what use are they to people like us? Well, I have 10 words for you, actually 10 numbers. 1914, 1929, 1939, 1945, 1955, 1968, 1975, 1986, 1992. If you know any of these years, you know why I mention them. The 20th century was perhaps the most violent and murderous in history, thanks in part to all that science and knowledge that was going to lift us, lift us onward and upward forever. Science and knowledge turned war from horses and sabers into airplanes and rockets and bombs. Modern science turned simple local economies into modern capitalism, into modern factories and modern socialism and modern pollution. And science and knowledge turn newspapers into television, radio, blogs, and, hands, and handheld smartphones. Any blithe confidence that science and knowledge will inevitably make life better in all ways is naive, and that includes us. Knowledge and power can amplify our human capacity for good, but also for evil. To pretend otherwise is to invite tragedy of Greek proportions. That's a great metaphor, Greek tragedy. It's a form of drama. We all know about the two masks that used to hang over theaters, the sad mask of tragedy and the smiling mask of comedy. Masks represent, these two forms represent two kinds of drama that we're all familiar with. And you could say that liberalism in all, every form is a comedy, which is to say cheerful and hopeful and optimistic. But we and you and I, we, we don't live in a drama, do we? We live in real life. And real life has its cheerful moments and its dreadful moments. It has its tragic as well as comic aspects. A fully three-dimensional liberal faith has to have some kind of tragedy in it. It has to account for things that don't go right and why they don't go right and why we can't make them right. There needs to be a tragic form of liberalism, but what could it be? Anais Nin made this observation which I think helps us out. All those who try to unveil the mysteries have tragic lives. Let me read that again. All those who try to unveil the mysteries have tragic lives. She goes on, at the end, they are always punished. Think about that. Maybe you know the ancient myth of Prometheus in the Greek world who went to Olympus and took fire from the gods and gave it to human beings who now could light their way at night and cook their food and literally become civilized. He is a hero. In fact, he's so much a hero if you go to Rockefeller Plaza in New York City, there's his, pic there's his statue hovering over the ice skating rink. I beautiful story, except that we forget the part that comes after that. For his effrontery of stealing fire from the gods, he is chained to a rock, and because he is immortal, he is doomed to have his liver pecked out forever by an eagle. If you knew that was going to happen to you, would you have done that? Would you have ventured into the world of knowledge if you knew it was going to cost you your liver? What are we who profess to be religious liberals, but people who question the sacred mysteries, who seek to pull away the robes that veil? How many of you have said, the emperor has no clothes in some other church? And what did you get for saying that? How many of you kept asking why long after the minister or the priest or the rabbi said, be quiet? How many of you long for a spirituality that does not require surrendering your questions? What was your reward? You might say that we are the Promethean faith. We are Prometheanists. We practice Prometheanism, the commitment to integrity and truth, 
even when it costs. You, some of you, have already paid for that when you left the church of your youth and perhaps found your friends a little less friendly. Or perhaps if you grew up here, you found yourself ostracized for being outside the, uh, the accepted norms. That was my story. You may find your friends less friendly, as I said. Sometimes your family is less familiar. There was a question in this week's religion and ethics column about the man who finds his daughter-in-law becoming very evangelical and asks the father-in-law if he has the same faith and he demurs and she falls into weeping and gnashing of teeth and now the family is torn apart by questions of faith. Maybe you have had that story in your life. I remember hearing the stories of the Bible as a young boy from my friends love their rosaries that they got to play with in church and that beautiful communion service and oh the incense <gasps> that was wonderful but then when i read the stories i couldn't quite understand them and i hope my mother would assure me that when i die i would go to heaven and she did not do that we who profess a liberal faith give up a lot we, in fact, like Prometheus, find ourselves gnawing at our own liver sometimes. The playwright August Wilson observes, or counsels, I should say, confront the dark parts of yourself, he says. Your willingness to wrestle with your demons will cause your angels to sing. Ours is a faith of struggle with our own demons and those of others. Our faith is a faith of work, and that puts us apart from those who depend upon grace, which is why we're not going to sing Amazing Grace. I'm giving you heads up. I saw that hymn, and I said, Jason, why did you put that there? Well, we all know it. And I said, yeah, but it's exactly opposite what I'm preaching today. I know the appeal of an, a religion of grace that without merit, without asking, you can be saved from what I ask. We don't need to get into heaven. We don't need to do anything except make this world a little less hell for those in it and those who in its lowest and most dreadful places. Grace is wonderful. A little good luck from time to time goes a long way. I've been known to buy a lottery ticket. How about you? But we don't depend upon it. We don't hang ourselves over saying, oh, if only grace would save me. No. If you are in our, sense, our side of the world, in our corner of the temple, we know there is struggle involved. The struggle with our own inward demons, with the ones that are out there, and the realization that that is as much in the Bible as any other story. Wisdom costs. It did not come free. It never shall. And when you wrestle, like Jacob did, the dark angel in Genesis, the end of that struggle may be that you live, but you come up lame. Which brings me back to my bad leg. Like it or not, we will all be lamed by life at some point. It may be physical, it may be emotional, it may be spiritual, who knows? It will happen. I have chosen to wait before I act upon the pain. I've observed its effects on me. Last Sunday, I was standing in line at some place to order a sandwich, and at that moment, the pain shot through me so much it was the only thing I could think about. And so when my order was misunderstood, I was very sharp and curt with the woman who was taking my order. She did not deserve it. And then I thought, how many people in the world enduring pain of all kinds look to us as angry or impatient or ungrateful, but we only hear the anger or the impatience. We don't imagine that they have a pain in their lives that's robbing all their goodwill, that's taking all their patience away. 
I can take Tylenol, and by God, it works. But how many people with pain of other kinds need something else but can't afford it or have no way of knowing it except perhaps to drink a little more or take some drugs that they have to buy on the street because that's the only way to get some relief. And yet when we see them struggling with alcohol and drugs, we think of their moral failures, not the pain that drives them to do something about it. You may well know that one of the things I love are taking long walks, especially over days and days, and suddenly I'm wondering, can I do that anymore? I'd hope to make a pilgrimage from Winchester to Canterbury in England. Oh, that would be marvelous, but that's a hundred and some miles. I imagine climbing to Machu Picchu, but I wonder if I can go now. How many people in pain find any kind of hope extravagant, whether it's a pain of body or of heart or soul, the pain of poverty or oppression? Pain teaches if you let it. It brings you closer to the deeper, darker, more prosaic realities of life. On a street corner in Beijing a few weeks ago, when my leg did not hurt, I'm walking at the end of the day, but I'm tired. It's hot. It's hazy. The pollution is everywhere. The people are everywhere. And as I stop at a street corner, a woman streaked with sweat on a hot and hazy day, is singing out loud. She's not singing cheerfully. She's singing angrily. The police approach to quiet her. She pushes them away and raises her song to a shout. She is evidently in some sorrow, some pain, some lament. She is sounding like a prophet. I wish I knew what the Chinese meant, but I knew something dreadful was on her. She would not accept help. She didn't want help. She wanted to be heard in her pain. Out of the depths, I cried to God, it says in the psalm. Are any of you, any of you suffering, says James? They should pray. They don't mean just pray for help. Pray that someone somehow is listening. Those who suffer, whatever the pain may be, are always praying, and that includes you and me. We ask, why do I hurt? How long must I suffer? What can I do about it, or am I doomed to carry this forever? Those are prayers. Job asked why he suffered. Jesus asked why he was alone. Every one of us has some pain somewhere in our life where we ask, why? And that question is our prayer. Out of the depths I cried to God, says the psalmist. Our faith, yes, ours, our liberal faith, our cheerful, optimistic, science and knowledge-based faith cannot escape and answer this question. Our faith, every last one of us, whatever their name may be, arises from the cry we make from the depth of our soul. Why? Why do I live? Why do I die? Why do I suffer? Why must others suffer? That's where faith begins. And it's not to answer those questions, but to be heard. The woman was not asking for someone to fix her life, but to be heard as a person who suffers. And the question I'm asking as I come to the end is whether our liberal faith has the courage to hear the suffering of our own and others. Can we sit in the quiet place of life and listen to our own suffering and not try to fix it or explain it? Can we listen without explaining it to the, to the pain of others? I do not know, but I know that if we do not have the courage to hear our own suffering, we have no room to listen to others. And so I invite us ever deeper into the struggles of life, not to end the pain, but that we may share it and be heard. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found true in thy sight, O thou who art my rock and my 
Redeemer. Yeah, I'm going to change the hymn. Mm -hmm. 